Welcome everyone uh, to this um, uh, broadcast uh, via Zoom from the Pacific Justice Institute. Uh, this is going to be a, hopefully a, a very uh, enlightening time. We had some, it's actually some really positive news, some great news uh, to be uh, talking about this uh, during the Zoom call. And uh, to open us up in prayer, I'd like our pastor liaison, uh, Peter Moore, to uh, come on and, and, uh, and uh, give this time to the Lord. Peter? Oh, Peter, are you there? Okay, I'm going to go and open up in prayer, and uh, we'll uh, give this to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the uh, freedom that we have to be able to uh, gather together via Zoom. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for you to um, to uh, let us be fo focused on the things that you want us to talk about. Um, let us not have our hearts of, uh, of anxiety and, and be anxious, Lord. There's, there's no reason for us to be anxious with you, Lord. And uh, let us keep our eyes on you while we're talking about these topics and give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, to our attorneys and others um, as we uh, delve into some of these, these serious challenges that we're facing today. Uh, thank you, God, for being with us now and uh, that we can put our hope and our trust in you no matter what we're facing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, to start off talking about some, um, some recent updates as far as some cases that we've taken on, many may not be aware of this, but we at the Pacific Justice Institute are a nonprofit 501c3 legal defense organization uh, specializing in defending religious freedom, parents' rights, the sanctity of life. We're unique in that we don't just cherry pick the high profile cases. Uh, we make sure no one's left on the side of the road when it comes to these issues. And uh, we have offices all across the United States. That's another thing that makes us unique. 13, uh, we have 15 offices in 13 states. Uh, defending faith, family, and freedom. So never hesitate to give us a call. We have hundreds of affiliate attorneys in addition to those offices all across the country. So if you have an issue, don't hesitate to, to contact us. Just go to our website, pji.org, and we'd love to, uh, to serve you and find out how we can help you with what you're dealing with. So we're gonna, on today's show, we're going to talk about uh, the, some updates in some of our cases with Matt. Um, after that, we're going to talk about some of the new regulations, restrictions involving the um, COVID vaccine mandates um, and, and, all, and some of the restrictions regarding uh, uh, colleges, high schools, childcare, uh, and also the impact on uh, private Christian schools and homeschooling. Uh, we actually have some, some good news on this topic today uh, that I think you'll find very, very encouraging. I know you'll find it very encouraging. Uh, we've done a lot of research um, addressing this. And we're also going to talk about uh, some of the, the actual regulations and some of the remedies that exist for parents in dealing with that. Um, we're also then going to talk to uh, an individual who's uh, really uh, been actively involved in uh, challenging uh, public schools and, uh, and really trying to, uh, to help parents uh, look at educational alternatives uh, moving forward. Um, so let's just uh, start off first with uh, Matt McReynolds. Uh, Matt, uh, so tell us if you could some of the uh, updates regarding some PJI cases that I think people are going to want to definitely know about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, can you hear and see me okay, Brad? Oh, yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. I like that light coming down from heaven on you. It looks great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, hello, everybody um, from our Sacramento office here. I'm coming to you from there today in Northern California. And just a lot of exciting things happening. We're just going to touch on it very briefly, not get into too many details in the interest of time. But literally last week, Brad, we had some great news out of the state of Texas, where we have an office um, in the Dallas area now, but really is able to cover all of Texas because we had a situation there with an evangelist down in the Houston area uh, who was criminally charged with a noise ordinance violation, something we see happen a lot in our other evangelism cases around the country. And our yeah. Dallas area attorney was able to go down to Houston to criminal court uh, just this past week and get those criminal charges dismissed. So that was a huge, um, not only a victory, but, but just a praise the Lord kind of a moment. And really just the latest in a string, a long string now of wins that we've been able to have for evangelism. Right. I remember our attorney out of uh, Miami, Alex, uh, uh, Bumdu, he's he did uh, he had a, a great success there defending an evangelist uh, who was being criminally prosecuted for you know preaching the gospel in a public place, 
they seem to have no problem with other people doing other activities and, and, and making noise and music and stuff. Um, so we, we, we see this happening more and more, and it's just, it's great for them to know that they can come to us no matter where they are, where the American flag is flying, that they can come to us and know that we're going to, we, we've got their back and we're going to represent them. And it's, uh, it's uh, so important. I know, you know, Matt, I, I sometimes wonder if, if we didn't do that, if we just let one person be uh, wrongfully prosecuted and spend time behind bars for preaching the gospel in the United States of America, what a chilling effect that would have on so many people. Um, from feeling comfortable to, to share their faith in, a, in the free country of the United States. Uh, there's another case I understand dealing with, uh, case matter dealing uh, with uh, Oregon and uh, a federal lawsuit that we recently filed. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, and actually a couple of federal lawsuits, Brad, that have been filed just within uh, the past month, I believe since even the last time that we were on here um, talking to everybody. But these are both cases involving teachers, three teachers in two different cases. And our dedicated full-time staff attorney in the state of Oregon is taking on the Grants Pass School District because it's doing a couple of different things to move against those teachers. First of all, there's a teacher who, like many of our other clients, is involved in evangelism on weekends and outside of his school time. And so Brad, if you can believe this, some of his fellow teachers saw him on a weekend out in the community uh, with another group who were preaching to just passers-by and people in the community. Those teachers went back to school the following week and made a complaint against him that they felt uncomfortable and unsafe to be with him in the school because he had been preaching on his own time, out, nothing to do with the school, uh, out in the community. So and because so they know. saw him preaching somewhere, because they saw him preaching somewhere, they felt unsafe. Um, you talk about bigotry. I mean, what? because you know, are Christians presumed, if we share our faith, that we're presumed to be dangerous uh, people? I mean, statistics show people that share their faith and live their faith aren't, aren't dangerous. We're actually very safe people. Um, so... This is just, I think, is just an example of, of masked uh, hatred uh, and intolerance by so many of those public school teachers in that, uh, in that school, unfortunately. What, so we filed a federal lawsuit on his behalf? Uh, that's right, Brad, because the school district conducted an investigation. They actually found he had done nothing wrong, but just for good measure, they told him, you didn't do anything wrong, but don't do it again. Don't let us find you, not just on a, a street corner, Brad. They told him that he better not be participating in like church youth group activities because, and this is so often the case with these kinds of cases, uh, there's a perception that if you're seen as being anti-LGBTQ, if you're seen as having a traditional uh, salvation, you know, sin and redemption, kind of a message, then you must be connected to, to a hate group. You must be perpetrating hate speech, and therefore they put these extraordinary restrictions on him, or tried to, even that have nothing to do uh, with his job. Yeah, so he couldn't teach uh, Sunday school if his church was located in the, in the school district, anywhere in the, the school district area. He couldn't teach Sunday school. I mean, I... I I think that with, with children, I think that's, um, oh, that's, that's so unconstitutional. And, um, but I think it's very telling of where we are in our society today. Um, I guess they would probably think uh, Billy Graham was a part of a, a, hate, a hate group because he preached about sin and all sin. He didn't cut out parts of the Bible. Um, but if you believe that the Bible says, uh, which is what he, did, he does, he believes what the Bible is very clear about with regard to sin, all sin. Um, then apparently uh, they're, you're, you're to be isolated, silenced, and, uh, and snuffed and snuffed out, at least in terms of your ability to uh, thrive in that community. So uh, that's a very important case. I'm glad we filed this lawsuit in federal court on, on his behalf. There's also one dealing with some, uh, a couple other teachers uh, who actually are part of that same school district, ironically enough, Grant, Grants Pass School District. Uh, what's, what's going on with, uh, with those teachers? Yeah, Brad, these teachers were, uh, weren't even preaching out in the community, but they were trying to start some online discussion 
um, about the transgender issue, trying to bring some sanity, trying to bring some common sense solutions. I think, Brad, probably not that much different from what you've tried to do with our groundbreaking documentary on the transgender issue to try to, to reach across and find you know, common ground, find uh, just some, some reasonableness on this issue. And so they've got suspended from their teaching jobs and their positions within the school district because of that. And I know uh, uh, Emily's gonna touch on some important Supreme Court decisions, including one that just came down today on freedom of association that are actually going to be very timely and uh, give a boost to cases, even cases like this that, we're, that we have in active litigation. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. Well, Matt, thank you so much for this update. We have other, many other cases. If you want to, we have over 50 cases in active litigation. It's growing. Uh, if you'd like to get assistance, or if you'd like to keep up with our cases, go to our website, pji.org. You can sign up to get our, our Legal Insider newsletter, where you'll get uh, updates every week on things that are taking place, uh, dealing with your freedoms and liberties, that you're not going to often hear about uh, from mainline media uh, and, and, and the press, uh, even some networks like Fox News um, sometimes don't, don't cover some of these real important stories uh, dealing with real cases and real people. Uh, now we have with us uh, right now uh, Pastor Peter Moore. He's we have uh, he's here via audio. So uh, Peter, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, just fine. So uh, Peter, uh, I, let me ask you. Uh, we have something really exciting coming up uh, this uh, Sunday, this July fourth. Uh, what's about to take place and how can people uh, get involved in uh, bringing this to their church, if not this Sunday, perhaps in the, uh, the Sundays uh, to follow? Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited about Civic Stewardship Sunday. This coming Sunday, we have a 12-step a uh, engagement plan for every pastor to encourage their church to be involved and uh, to be salt and light in the community. I've heard from churches outside of California, Nevada, and Arizona, but we're, we're specifically focusing on those three states, and uh, over 500 churches have already committed to, to standing up this Sunday and saying, hey, we have to steward uh, our freedoms and liberties, and that's what uh, July 4th is all about, is uh, the freedoms that we're given are not given to us by the government, but by God. So, so how many churches do you have again that have signed up to do this this Sunday? As of right now, 521, and uh, uh, you know we're we're looking for more. So if you if you if you haven't committed, I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. Okay, excellent. And they can do voter registration. There's a lot of things that their church can do. There's still time, and if they don't do it this Sunday, Peter, then they can uh, their church can do something like this in the following Sundays. Um, to make a, a real positive, proactive difference. To me, it's a no-brainer. Um, you know, we, we appreciate our freedom. This is one way of showing it and also showing that we really do care about people outside our church walls. And that includes uh, showing that concern by registering and voting. Um, that's a, a real positive. I want to thank you for what you're doing, uh, reaching out to pastors and churches all across the country uh, to, to make a real difference. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for being on the program, and um, we really appreciate having you as a part of our team and serving as a pastor liaison to serve churches and pastors all over the country. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. God bless. Thanks, Peter. Uh, we have some recent decisions that have come down from the Supreme Court, actually yesterday, today, that I want to touch on now before we get into the, uh, the vaccine mandates and the new regulations involving the masks and all, um, and some of the good news we have to report on that. Uh, so I'd like to talk about first of those, those Supreme Court decisions that came down and help us do that. Uh, we have with us attorney Emily Mimna, who is our star attorney who serves out of our uh, Nevada office there in Reno. Uh, Emily, um, I understand that, uh, that the Supreme Court ruled on the Arizona laws to um, fight uh, election fraud. Uh, what, what, what went on here? First, what, what, was the, what, were the law, what was the law about? What was it doing? that uh, some people were objecting to? Right, well, uh, first and foremost, we'll say some people, the people bringing this case was the Democratic National Committee. So those are some people in that case. And <laughs> yes. you know, just for the avoidance of doubt, as lawyers like to say, 
Um, so that ruling came out this morning and that was at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that, uh, that ruling along with one other one that we'll talk about marks the, not the end of technically, but the recess for the Supreme Court. Um, though their website tells us their work is unceasing. So don't think that their school's out for the summer there. But in the Arizona case, they looked at a series of voting laws and the Democrats would say restrictions, which required among other things, but foremost in their objections was a requirement that if you live in, a, in an area that has precinct assigned voting, you, you need to vote. In, if you're gonna vote in person, you need to vote in your assigned precinct. And they also require, had limits, limits on what's usually referred to as ballot harvesting or ballot gathering, which is to say, they allow it to be clear, they do allow it, but they don't allow anybody, you know, I can't just go pick up my neighbor's ballot and hand it in for her. It has to be, you know, your caretaker or a family member or someone like that. And, and so those were seen as too onerous and they were objected to and under section two of the Voting Rights Act or sometimes referred to as the VRA, if you see that, that's the 1965 Act, and they said that this is a, these are violations. And what the the crux of this here really, and and for those who were objecting to these um, restrictions, they are extremely aggrieved by the ruling of the court. They said it's not enough. The court said it's not enough that you may be able to demonstrate that this has a disparate impact along racial or other you know other lines for some protected group. You ne you need to show you need to demonstrate that when these laws were passed, there was actually an intent an intent to discriminate. And that of course the um, Democrats could not establish because there was no such intent. And for that reason, their objections failed. And that was a six, three ruling. Yeah, solid. Um, what I think is important about this case is, um, is that it opens the door for other states to be, able, to be confident in uh, passing similar laws to fight election fraud. It was massive. I mean, whether it impacted the outcome of the presidential race or congressional races, I'm not going to go there that debate. But what is indisputable is that there was fraud on, in, in multiple states on a very large scale. Um, so I'm glad that they're, they're addressing this uh, and getting it um, and, and, and affirming this, the Arizona's decision to pass this law. As far as, uh, you know, the, the, the whole concept of uh, precincts, uh, if someone is allowed to just vote in any precinct, then they could vote in uh, multiple precincts. But if they have to vote in the one where they are registered, I mean, where it's close to where they live, and that, then that's one way of eliminating people voting multiple times. That makes sense. And then as far as the ballot harvesting, we had, like in California, we've seen that abused terribly. People going to nursing homes and, and people who are have maybe dementia, et cetera, just getting them to fill out the ballot the, uh, the way that the Democrat wants, uh, the activist, and, and, uh, and then only uh, putting, filing those that are for Democrat candidates and not the others. Uh, we, it, it's a lot, of, a lot of fraud we've seen in that, so I'm glad those were addressed. Uh, and I think that, uh, in the, that this is going to be a, a strong signal to help protect our elections. Uh, that's a, a good, good, good message. There's another real important case uh, that came out dealing with donor privacy and the extent to which the government or others can find out where an individual um, has given a substantial donation to a cause or uh, a ministry. Uh, what, what, what went on with this case? This case came out of California. Um, unsurprisingly, California wanted to be able to peer into the records, financial records of nonprofits or what, what are called charitable organizations in the state. So in California, as in other states, if you're a charitable organization seeking to solicit or raise funds, you need to register with the attorney general. And in California, that registration, which is annual, so every year, you have to send them a copy of your IRS form 990, which includes something called Schedule B. And Schedule B will include your so-called major donors, and that includes their names and their addresses. And of course, as we've seen in this cancel culture, the censorship, and, and frankly, just retaliation and really nasty, um, I would say, on American behavior, when you find people are giving money to groups that you don't like, you know, people decide that they're going to act accordingly. Um, and it's not always um, even, you know, civil disagreement. And in California in particular, and I will say this, and <laughs> you can quote me, the ACLU was extremely helpful in this case. And they filed a brief um, in support 
of the charitable organizations that sued California. And they pointed out that California's, uh, that California said, oh, we're holding this information confidential and private. So don't worry, you can trust us. Um, if that doesn't mean <laughs> reach for your wallet, I don't know what will. But, um, you, you know, they, they made a sieve look like a steel safe compared to how they were doing with keeping the records. And the ACLU documented this and it was really horrifying. They, they showed you could easily get the confidential financial information of just about any organization that registered with California. So this went to the Supreme Court. And in, in this case, and this was actually a consolidation of two cases, um, but the one that you'll see cited probably is Americans for Prosperity, but also the Thomas More uh, Law Foundation also brought a case that were consolidated. And the Supreme Court said, also in a 6-3 plurality decision, they, they said that, no, this does, this, this is, it's called compelled disclosure, right? You're required to disclose this. And they said, no, this has a chilling effect on freedom of assembly. You're not going to give money to a group you support if you're worried about retaliation or your personal details being published. This has a chilling effect on the freedom of assembly. And then the real, um, and I won't dig too deep into this, but if people have questions, please ask us. The standard of review was really at issue here as well. And they said in these compelled disclosure cases under freedom to assembly under the First Amendment, we're going to apply something called exacting scrutiny. And if you're saying, what the heck does that mean? That's what everyone else was saying too. And the Supreme Court was really helpful. And they said, you know, there's a lower standard than strict scrutiny, but it is still has teeth. Thank you, Alito, and your concurrence for telling us that. It has real teeth. And what that means is that the state in these compelled disclosure cases, they have to still engage in what we call narrow, narrow tailoring. And they have to at least consider alternate means. So this narrow tailoring doesn't have to have, doesn't have to be the least restrictive means possible, which is what we see in the strict scrutiny cases, but it does need to be narrowly tailored. And okay. what you know, called a blunderbuss approach is no good. Right. Okay. So the significance here is that, so let's say I, uh, I want to give, I'm, I'm, so I live, say I live in California and I want to give a thousand dollars to a, a pro-life, pro-family organization. This law in California would have allowed the government to have all my personal information to get that from the, the, the charity and, and then I've got to trust that somehow it's not going to be leaked out so that groups could, couldn't, um, you know, sh shoot bullets through my doors or, uh, you know, or something else, uh, you know, even worse. So, uh, or, or, or cause employees to lose their jobs, for example, maybe employees who work for the government, perhaps. This, this would be, would have been so destructive for freedom and liberty, particularly for those who are, have uh, strong religious convictions and they live in a, an intolerant state like say California or New York or Illinois uh, where tolerance uh, for people of faith is um, uh, minimized, unfortunately. So I think that this is a, a great decision, protects my privacy and our ability to, uh, to support groups. One other thing I'd like to note, by the way, just for people's information, uh, we at Pacific Justice Institute are, take that privacy very seriously. So we're glad about this decision, but also uh, we actually encrypt um, all of our, our, our donor supporter base of people. So it can't be hacked and, and taken. Uh, there's a, a, a solid wall of encryption, firewall protecting that. Uh, in addition, we don't sell out our, our, our donor lists uh, to uh, other groups or outside groups. I'd say we're, you know, maybe less than 1% have our policy. The rest of them do that all the time. So we think we, we looked at this case as very, very important because maintaining that privacy for our supporters is as a 501c3 is, is taken very, very seriously to the highest level. Um, right, I'm gonna add, add one thing on that, which is to say PJI and these plaintiffs were not complying previously with this disclosure requirement. Okay, that we were submitting redacted Schedule Bs, which is to say that we did not include your name or your address. It was just California decided to bring action against these people, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were very, prote very, very protective. And, um, and that's, that's very important, but I'm glad they ruled this way. So now, you know, there'll be this, um, California won't be able to be the big bully and, uh, and, and uh, make people very vulnerable to be harassed and, and who knows what um, because of their, their beliefs and the organizations they support. So this is a, a, great, a great victory. Mind you though, real quick, there were still three justices that thought this was fine, right? I mean, that's disturbing that there are three justices that would allow people to be able to be persecuted in effect for practical, all practical purposes because of who they support. And there are three justices that supported uh, you know, the, the, the Arizona, uh, the, um, 
you know, banning the Arizona rules to, to protect ele against election fraud. So, I mean, just the fact that this wasn't a 9-0 decision should be alarming that we have three justices on the Supreme Court uh, that um, are willing to rule in a way that is very threatening to our freedoms and liberties. People should take note of that, especially with coming the next presidential election when it comes to electing uh, a president who's going to be appointing more justices to our courts, including possibly the Supreme Court. All right, let's move on uh, to the, uh, the existing regulations regarding mask and vaccination requirements for our schools. Uh, Emily, what do, you, what do you have to report on that? I know things are changing. Uh, what do people need to know in, in regards to this? Well, starting at the highest level, congratulations to Washington and Michigan. You guys were a little late to the party, but let it, better late than never. You are now, all of America, all the states have lifted general COVID restrictions, which is to say social distancing, capacity limits, et cetera. There is no state that requires masks outdoors. Um, with, there are some exceptions for, uh, for if hospitals if you were in an outdoor area of a hospital or public transportation hubs. Okay, that's different. But generally speaking, those, those requirements don't exist. And there are only 10 states plus DC that require masks indoors for unvaccinated persons um, or for vaccinated persons as well. And those are generally, again, clustered on the West Coast and the East Coast. So we're talking Washington, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Illinois. And then you're looking at uh, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Virginia, and also DC and Hawaii. Um, you still have a couple of quirks in there. Hawaii is going to lift their uh, mandatory 10-day um, isolation requirement um, on July 8, if you don't have a negative test within 72 hours. And Kansas actually has a funny um, ha has a funny isolation requirement as well if you entered the state from afar. And um, Connecticut, for example, still requires restaurants to seat people with uh, in groups of eight or fewer. So you see a couple of quirks here and there, but generally speaking, masks are off indoors if you're fully vaccinated. Now, yeah. California, California um, caused a little bit of confusion because they, they were a little out of sync for a while where Cal OSHA was going one direction and the governor shockingly was going more liberal, but of course he's looking at his recall numbers and thinking and planning accordingly, um, my opinion. Um, so they, they got aligned right before the call we had last week or last last week. And so what we're seeing now is if you're fully vaccinated in the employment context, you do not need to wear a mask. Again, unless you're in the, you know, the hospital or a, a correctional facility or transportation, you know, high density type situation. So there are still exceptions, but generally speaking, fully vaccinated, you do not need to wear a mask. Yeah. Uh, and I, one of my pet peeves regarding this is dealing with uh, the, those people who've had the COVID. Uh, a, a, a Cleveland Clinic came out with a study saying that people who've had COVID actually have a stronger immunity and a broader immunity than those who were vaccinated. And yet, the problem I see here, Emily, is that um, they don't include those who have already had the, 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 the COVID with, with those vaccinated. They, they treat like they're like it has no positive effect at all and, and they have to wear masks. Um, do you see any, anything, any movement to, to correct this, uh, this error and understanding of, of science and, and what the studies are showing that, that uh, those who've had COVID, should it actually be, should be treated uh, at the very least with the same degree of, of freedom and liberty as those who've been vaccinated? We have had some um, recent success on that front, not, you know, not on policy level, but when individuals come to us, for example, we were able to write a letter for a college athlete who was on scholarship and who had had COVID, had natural immunity, and also had a religious objection to the vaccine. And with a, you know, a letter citing the Cleveland Clinic and her personal religious views, they were willing to accept that as sufficient. Um, and I want, I want to add that educational settings, K-12 in California are also subject to these mass requirements, which is extremely onerous and a whole nother conversation. Um, but we are seeing success there. And for example, CSU Chico, there's a lawsuit filed by three, three students, I believe, who have had COVID and have the natural antibodies. And there, their focus is on the negative adverse reactions people can have to vaccines, the COVID vaccines, particularly if they've already had COVID. Yeah, and that's, that's another scientific fact. People who've had COVID who then have the vaccine are more likely than not to have a more serious reaction. So, uh, you know, I just, it's just crazy, you know, that we, we have science is very clear on these points. And it's just, uh, it's like government just wants to, uh, you know, to, to clamp down and have more control than what is supported with, uh, I would say, even a rational basis once we look at the, the evidence and the science of, uh, of the matter. What about, um, you know, private Christian schools, homeschools, how, does, how are they affected 
by these mask vaccine requirements, are they impacted as well? They are usually, specifically in California, we know that they are. However, um, I'll circle back to California. So generally speaking, with these health mandates, you're not going to be exempted the way you are. Uh, for example, like private school is not subject to FERPA, which is the school equivalent of HIPAA. Okay, so if you're a private K-12 through school, you're not taking money from the federal government, you won't be subject to FERPA, which again is like HIPAA. Um, but in these health contexts, no, you're not going to be exempted. And so that's something we've been working very hard with private schools to help them um, adjust and accommodate. And of course, for parents, you have to decide what, what you're going to do. Now in California, they did say when they published their revised Beyond the Blueprint um, they, on June 15, they said that they were going to be adjusting these K-12 through masking requirements to reflect the CDC updates as they come. So I'm still remaining optimistic that all of the efforts we know people are bringing at the grassroots level, all these different really great groups, um, California Parents United, other groups are working really hard to get masks off of children. Um, and so there's that. And then of course, we still know we have religious and medical exemptions. And the last piece I'll add that's very, very important for California parents to understand is that although California is extremely hostile towards religious exemptions, we know that even medical ones, there's a bill and you're probably familiar with it, um, SB 277, which was actually signed into law by Newsom in 2019. And here's what I wanna emphasize. Although there are no, no religious exemptions for the vaccines that are currently required, so we're talking about mumps, chicken pox, et cetera, it also specifically states that if they approve a new vaccine, so CDPH, California Department of Public Health, if they decide that the COVID vaccine should be mandatory, they are legally required, and I'm gonna underscore this, highlight it, mark it, hit it with a highlighter, whatever you want. Um, they are required to give you a religious exemption if you qualify. So if you have a sincerely held religious belief and you want to opt out, get an alternative, get an accommodation, um, ask for one, reach out to us if you need help. And I, I think Brad's gonna tell you a little bit more about how we're gonna make that easier for you. Yes, in fact, we're working um, on, a, on a basic letter for, for parents. And of course it, it needs to be, uh, part of this is gonna have a, a, an opportunity for the parents to explain their own sincerely held religious beliefs. If anyone hands you a, a, a piece of paper and it just has a box that you check uh, and saying, uh, yeah, I have sincerely held religious beliefs against the vaccine and you just sign it and, and send it in, that's, that's not a, a good approach to take. You wanna make sure that you have gone out of your way to, to personalize it. It's, it's your beliefs, it's your sincerely held religious beliefs. So let's say, for example, you have a sincerely held religious beliefs that, um, that your body is God's temple and uh, that you need to take care of your body and that uh, this vaccine is new, it's risky, um, it's, it's immoral for you to be um, hazardous and uh, with regards to what you put in your body. Just, I mean, this is one example, for example. Um, you, you'd, you'd wanna write that out on what we're gonna be providing you. And then also you wanna at least cite a scripture, ideally one or two scriptures. Uh, people say, well, that's religious and I don't want the court to be against me. In reality, if you cite scripture, they can't disagree with you. They can't argue theology. It just validates, though, your sincerity of your religious belief. And uh, if you would like this, this is something uh, very important because I, I told you last Zoom call, we we're going to be researching to try to find out what back door is there, what, what angle can we take to make it so that parents will not have to be forced to have their kids vaccinated if they have their children in a public school or a private school for that matter. Well, it looks like we've, we've been able to, to find that back door. That's the good news. And uh, there's some other angles and avenues we could argue if we needed, but this is uh, very important. Our legal team did a fantastic job uh, going through and researching this. So we wanna help you. One thing you, you can do also uh, is when you get this, this form or you let your, um, let your, your private, if you have a private Christian school, uh, we're gonna be providing you like a, a cover letter of, of explanation. We'll send that to your private Christian school along with the link where they can cl uh, click that. Parents you know, of kids in your school can just cl click that and have that, that, that uh, basic uh, letter, format letter. For parents put in their personal information and uh, they can send that to the, the private school or they can send it to the public school. Uh, but this is very important. So private schools need to take advantage of this. So none of their parents feel uneasy. None of them are pulling their kids out, you know, leaving the state unnecessarily. This is very important. So if you want that, just uh, contact our office, go to our website, pji.org, whether it's getting a copy of this, um, I guess it's vaccine opt-out uh, letter uh, for either you or to be massively distributed 
and made available to the people in your private Christian school. Uh, just let us know. We'll be happy to get that information. But this is a game changer in many ways, shapes and forms. It's very helpful. There's a traditional vaccine, Novavax, and another one coming out uh, this fall. For those who don't have an objection to vaccines in general, but just have an objection to these uh, higher risk vaccines, uh, that's another nice thing to, to know about. But that's not the answer to everyone because a lot of people are, are, are very critical of vaccines. So that's not going to help them. But this religious exemption is very material, very helpful. Uh, and I really appreciate that, uh, Emily, you making that uh, very clear um, uh, moving on. Uh, so uh, this can, um, uh, I think this is going to be very helpful. Uh, you know, Matt, Emily, um, right now, how would you see the risk element uh, for parents in states like California, New York, Illinois? Do you see these states and school districts, uh, you know, jumping on uh, these, these mandates, telling parents uh, they have to have their kids vaccinated and uh, or their kid can't go to school without even letting them know about the religious exemption. What, what are your thoughts on this? Because I'm really concerned a lot of parents are simply not going to know. They're going to get these letters saying you have to have your kid vaccinated or else. And uh, they're not going to know about this, this important option of religious exemption. Well, we're, we're working obviously very hard today and every day to let people know what their rights are, what their options are, particularly in all ways to defend parental rights and religious liberty. Uh, but it, it is, it's disheartening because we see an overwhelming, I think, message from the media, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, which is great if you want to, um, but it's, it's extremely coercive if you don't. And I can tell you there's nothing under the sun that will ever make my mother get vaccinated and she was a practicing nurse for 30 something years. And I think it's telling, frankly, that the almost a majority of the folks at the CDC have chosen not to get vaccinated. So I, I do think it is unfair that people are being, um, I think, maligned for asking questions. Um, before injecting something into their body. And so I think parents are right to ask questions and want to know what are the consequences for my child. And, you know, we've also been seeing a lack of informed consent where people are not being told about the right, especially while it's only authorized, it's not FDA approved. They're not being told that they have the right not to take this vaccine. So it's important to share this information. And um, I would encourage everyone to go to our website, pji.org as well. There's a great um, resource called the um, vaccine Q&A that will answer, I, I think, a lot of questions folks might have. Yeah, now that also deals with uh, the workplace, employees, as well as consumers. People want to take a trip somewhere and maybe they're told, oh, we have to have a vaccine passport. It's, it's very broad and empowering people with regards to these uh, vaccine mandate issues, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, because the employment context we know you have Title VII, which you don't have um, applying in the school context, which is different than what rights you have if you're just walking into the Costco. So it's important to know where you do and do not have protection. I, we are adding some information right now to clear up confusion about HIPAA because HIPAA really is much more limited. So it's important to know about your Title VII options or in California, your, your rights under SB 277. And if you don't see something specific to your state, let us know. Because if we don't know the answer, then it's even better because we'll find out together. Yeah, and when we produce these, these uh, research projects, uh, I want people to know, don't be intimidated. We don't do what some lawyers do where they, they put it in, uh, put some, some you know, Latin phrases and, and lots of cases and, and make it very complex. We, we really make it fairly straightforward, easy to understand. And uh, it's very well researched. We're very thorough on our, our legal analysis, but it's very understandable, very empowering. I strongly recommend people to take advantage of this very valuable resource. And we're updating it all the time as uh, new things come out. Um, so that's, that's gonna be very helpful. And I encourage people to take advantage of that. Uh, you know, Matt, uh, you know, what do you see as um, something that parents should um, you know, take hold of uh, as they deal with this question of a possible mandate coming out um, from their school district uh, regarding this fall. Uh, you know, if the FDA approves it or doesn't approve it, uh, we can still see school districts putting forth these kind of mandates. Um, I mean, it's, uh, what, 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 what advice would you give to parents? Hey, well, first, uh, Brad, something you mentioned uh, just a few moments ago reminded me uh, about the work that we've been doing involving parents and parental rights and education for the last uh, 20 plus years 
And that is in the realm of sex education, uh, the statutes are crystal clear that schools have to provide um, notice, they have to provide opt-in rights, um, they have to give parents the opportunity to, to avoid that, right? And even though that is so clear and has been clear for a long, long time in statutes, we still find school districts that routinely ignore that. And so with this, this new, um, what we found that's just buried in the statutes uh, with SB 277, as Emily alluded to, I fully expect that very, very few, if any school districts are gonna be telling parents about this option. And so that's why it's so important uh, that those listening to us today help us get out the word about that. Um, and as soon as we have that form um, available, within the coming days, then we're going to want to get it very widely distributed because yeah, they're just yeah. not going to hear that from probably any school districts, certainly not the vast majority of them. Wow. I mean, that is very telling. You, so you don't think any school districts or at least the vast majority are, are not going to let parents know about the religious uh, exemption, opt-out exemption. Uh, that was my gut too. I, that was my concern. So that's why we all need to work hard to get out this information. If you're a parent and you see, hear this, say, oh, okay, I'm gonna go to Pacific Justice is uh, link and, um, and uh, you know, next week, or I'm gonna uh, sign up to get their legal insider newsletter where we'll be announcing it or making that available. Uh, and that'll be good, that'll help me. Well, that's great, it helps you, but that's not good enough. We need to save as many as we can and, and empower parents not to be in this dire situation of having to feel like, they have to suddenly like leave the state uh, or homeschool when it's a single parent with a single provider and homeschooling is not very easy. Um, now there is another option uh, that I, I wanna touch on if we can, and that is the church homeschool co-ops. Uh, Matt, what is your thought about these church homeschool co-ops? My understanding is that there's a lot of churches now taking this very seriously in view of all the kids that are leaving public schools already. Uh, much less uh, the potential second wave that could be coming uh, this fall. Uh, what, what do we have with regards to resources to help churches easily uh, start a church homeschool co-op? Sure. Well, I'll just say first off, from a personal standpoint, Brad, um, you know, I was homeschooled um, all the way through and even, even through uh, higher education. But we largely did a, a go it alone kind of approach. And there were some families around us that were just starting to, to do some co-op kinds of things. So the explosion of homeschooling and of options and resources within the last 10 to 15 years has been tremendous. Would have loved to have had some options like the homeschool co-ops uh, available several years ago. Um, when when my family was doing this, Th this is just something that really was not an option, did not exist, you know, a couple decades or more ago, and uh, it's something that I think both churches and families should take advantage of. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a great opportunity. Just it's, we're talking about parents and families working together, meeting at a church, and they can reach out to kids whose parents can't homeschool for whatever reason. Uh, it's a great opportunity, so I think we need to. And we have four, four different ways of doing that. And we have that resource available on our website. Uh, we are pastor liaison, Peter Moore will be happy to work with churches and pastors out there. We're doing it. And uh, it's a great opportunity to reach out to kids um, in a fantastic way in view of the, what I call the spiritual genocide taking place in many, many of our public schools across the country. Um, now, I have someone I'd like to bring on now to talk about um, just like why parents right now should be considering uh, the homeschooling option. And then we're gonna do some Q and A's. And by the way, if you have a question, feel free to uh, submit in the chat, make sure you include your first name and also where you're from, your, your you know, city and state, Boise, Idaho, wherever. Uh, and, and, uh, and let us know that uh, your, your question, we'll be happy to call on you. When I call on you, just be ready to unclick that, that mute button so you can uh, quickly be able to respond in, in a timely manner um, and, ask, and ask your question in a timely manner so we can uh, get through as many of these as possible. Uh, but we have with us here, uh, Ms. Uh, Kelly uh, Shinkuski. Uh, Kelly, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, tell me, Kelly, why did you 
uh, you know, give me some of your background as to what compelled you to pull your kids out of public schools and start homeschooling. Right. Uh, I started seeing educational concerns in our children's school district back in 2017, and Pacific Justice Institute was the organization that we went to when we needed support with those matters. But I volunteered with all, all different kinds of classes and library, and I was starting to see the implementation of social emotional learning, the new California Healthy Youth Act, and since then, I've continued my research, but I'm watching agendas being woven into every subject matter. Okay, yeah, and it's, it's very evident. Uh, I guess the, the, the sex education has been very obvious, uh, mm -hmm. hasn't it, with the new um, sexuality and the, the radical LGBTQ material. Uh, you, did you see that coming into your school? I know so many parents are reporting that across the country. Yes, that was in the school district. They brought in Planned Parenthood to teach at the middle school and the high school. And the content and material is not only unscientific, but it's very graphic and would surprise most people to view the content. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know we have a video called the Sex Ed, S-E-X-X-X -X -X Ed. It was not a mistake, someone didn't just get the, the, the X key stuck. Uh, there's a reason there's three X's. Um, it's called, so it's called sex ed, let parents uh, decide. Um, it's very en enlightening, it's very graphic, but it's just material straight from the state mandatory requirements, one of the, the, one of the programs that are uh, been approved by the state and being used by many school districts. And, uh, and it's meeting the, 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 this, these outrageous requirements that the state's dictated on all public schools, even charter schools in California. But then it's also gone to like Fort Worth, Texas. Their school districts adopted this garbage. Uh, Austin, Texas adopted and then the parents revolted and uh, they rescinded it uh, last I heard. But uh, school districts across America, the Midwest, South. So this is something really serious, but also there's the critical race theory as well. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts about that in terms of parents uh, having concerns. Do you think there's a growing concern parents have about their children uh, hearing something that uh, incriminates, makes one, one group of people because of their race uh, deliberately feel guilty and, uh, and ashamed while making another group because of their race uh, feel uh, oppressed uh, and uh, void of, of opportunity for uh, advancement? Absolutely. Um, and right now, that's something that we've been exposing in the area I'm in in Monterey County, but the ethnic studies curriculum being taught in one of the school districts here is following point by point this book called Critical Race Theory by Richard Delgado. And that book is a college textbook that is being used um, for teacher credentialing programs. And so people will say, oh, critical race theory is not taught in K through 12, but um, that is a game of semantics, I believe, um, because what's happening is though that phrase, the three words, are the three words are not in the curriculum, it follows that book point by point. It talks about mm -hmm. money, it talks about oppression. There's one page in this curriculum that says you are a racist. Um, so it's been quite revealing to see. Really? Right. Yeah, you know, the overwhelming uh, majority of Americans um, have ancestors who came to this country, uh, never owned slaves. The overwhelming majority never owned slaves. So it's, uh, it's this weird, this false narrative. And then they, they telling our children who are raised in a society where uh, we have so much uh, fantastic opportunity uh, to tell them that somehow they should feel guilty if they've worked hard and advanced. Um, I do believe it's sort of ironic that they don't, they don't focus on the inferior public schools that exist in the inner cities and the urban areas, in right. America, which is the big elephant in the middle of the room of bigotry and intolerance, and nor does it advocate uh, school choice, which would be very liberating for these mm -hmm. parents who have such uh, grotesquely inferior schools in the urban areas uh, I see a lot of hypocrisy. Let me just move on, though, if I can, because uh, uh, we, we're going to get to the Q&A, questions and answers. But um, Kelly, what, if, what in your heart, if you were going to uh, advise people something, uh, 
you know, with regard to homeschooling, what would it be? What, what do you think that needs to be a good takeaway right now? Well, for me, um, it is that you, you are either the one discipling your child or someone else will disciple your child. Um, mm. They're dumbing down curriculum in the public schools and weaving topics that are agendas onto our children at various ages, but um, they're actually lowering academic rigor in the name of this word equity. But I would say, especially for homeschooling, um, my kids, I, I was anti-homeschooling before all this happened and I've had a complete change. And I, I thought, oh, I'm gonna you know, replicate the public school system at home and it's gonna take so much time. And I thought all these things, I thought my children won't have a social environment. And those are all false ideas that I had that yeah. have been wrong time and time again. Oh, I, I know and studies show that those who are homeschooled have a lower teenage pregnancy rate, uh, lower drug abuse, alcohol abuse rate, less likely to drop out, less likely to commit crimes and have faster advancement in corporate, in corporations. Uh, right. than those who attended private schools or public schools actually have a uh, greater maturity. Uh, and it's, it's pretty exciting. The, uh, the opportunities when I see uh, that are, that are opened up for, for people who choose homeschooling, and then the homeschool co-ops uh, take right. the whole thing on steroids in terms of the broadening potential to help so many more parents who otherwise felt that the homeschooling would not be uh, accessible. Thank you so much, Kelly, for being on this program. And, um, I appreciate all you're doing uh, to uh, stand up uh, for and enlighten parents to their opportunities to um, not have their kids in public schools, at least uh, not anymore. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. that. I want to open it up now for Q&A uh, if we can. We've got a lot of questions. You guys are, um, I'm very impressed. So thank you. We're going to go, go as fast as we can. So get ready to do your unmute button. Uh, first, let's start with Scott in Bellingham, Washington. Scott in Bellingham, Washington. What's your question? Hey, uh, yep. Um, so uh, yeah, my employer is requiring us to return back to in-person work. Um, we've been working remotely for the last year, uh, but anyone who's not vaccinated is gonna be required to mask, uh, which I will not do. Um, so pending any kind of reprimand or whatever actions they take against me up to maybe even being terminated, um, do I have any kind of recourse? Oh, interesting. Now, you're working for a private company, I take it, not the government, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Emily, Matt, what, what say you? Well, your first and foremost, um, with any of these employment situations, is to see whether or not you have a medical exemption or a religious exemption. I'm, I'm guessing you don't have a medical exemption because you're asking this question. Um, but for those um, who may have medical exemption, when we say medical exemption, to be clear, we're talking about something specific to you, the individual, not a general, I object to the medicine on which the vaccine is provided or founded. And then if you have a religious objection, that's your sincerely held religious belief under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and if those aren't um, you know, if, if you, even if you bring your religious objection, okay, the employer is required to reasonably accommodate you if it doesn't impose a quote undue hardship. So that's really context specific to your employment. And there are also alternatives that we've been helping individuals propose if you don't wear a mask. For example, I have a client right now in California who, for religious reasons, will not wear a mask and will not get vaccinated. Um, she works for a federal employer. It's very, I, to be honest, it's very challenging. But you can propose antibody testing. You can propose weekly testing. There are face shields if you're uh, amenable to that. So it really depends on what accommodations, um, singular or plural, you might be open to and how willing they are to work with you. Ultimately, of course, your recourse would be to file a complaint um, with the right. EEC. Yeah, that's right. And we're here to, to serve you. And once again, uh, go to our website, download that resource. It's vaccinations Q&A. Uh, we, we're dealing with, with these, uh, these issues, and it's going to be very, very helpful. I strongly recommend you take advantage of that, um, but uh, very good question. Rose in Washington State, and after that, I'm gonna we're going to bring up Carol in uh, Skagit uh, County, Washington. But right now, Rose in Washington State. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hey. So I guess for me, my biggest fear is because I have to stay in Washington uh, due to my student midwifery status uh, with my college and my local preceptor, I don't have the option to just like up and move like many okay. of my friends have. 
Um, and I'm concerned that um, the state is really overstepping on parental uh, authority to the point where there actually, there has been one case I know of at my church where a child has been re-educated and taken from their family uh, and the family is facing, they're, they're facing um, some sort of legal battle to try and get the child back. Oh, uh, social work, so social workers took the child from because, the family because the family would not vaccinate the child. No, because the family would not agree with the trans agenda. Oh, transsexual agenda. Yeah. So, and like, I can't be a foster parent because in, in my state, because of that as well, uh, because of my deeply held religious conviction. Okay. And let, so me I'm just say, let me just say, right, let me say right off the bat, I, we've dealt with these cases before, have those parents contact our office immediately. Um, because uh, we've dealt with these cases where the government took the child, the child says, I want to change my gender. They're 13. Um, and we had to step in and, uh, and represent and, pre and prevent that from, from taking place, the government from doing that. Uh, that's very important. So I would have them contact us immediately. Do you have any other questions or? Uh, I was just wondering what my legal rights were and how I could prevent that from happening to my family because it is a very real uh, fear that I face when even right. though my kids are in a parent led school, um, it's still uh, funded by you know the state. And so I just don't know what my rights are as a parent to protect my children. Right, well, first off we have an, an excellent resource is called 12 steps to protect your children from CPS or social workers. It's okay. on our website. Uh, he's going to send it. Well, I would go to our website actually and click that where you'll be able to, uh, to download that. In fact, um, our videographer here is going to send you that, that link. So you Thank can you. go there and get that information. Every parent in America should have that immediately accessible um, because when CPS knocks on their door, there's, there's not a lot of time. And uh, that talks about specifically what you need to do pr to protect your kids. The bad news is um, about 50% of the time, the children don't, go, don't come back. The government gets them, they get $8,000 per federal, per head they take by the federal government per year. So, you know, do you do the math? They have a high financial incentive to take children. Um, however, those that implement what we tell them to do, I would say they probably have a 98, 99% probability of not losing their kids okay so it's very very effective very important i'm glad you asked that question like for sake of time we got to move on though carol yeah. in skagit county washington carol hi brad thank you so much for doing this um first of all really quick scott that you just talked to before her is a friend of mine and he may be losing his job if he does if they fire him who could he reach out to specifically there is that something you could give us information yeah, I would have him contact Pacific Justice Institute. We have an office there in Washington State. We have another one in Oregon. Uh, we have one in, in Nevada, Texas, Mississippi, Florida, Ohio, New York, uh, Wisconsin, I'm probably or Colorado. So we, wherever you are in the country, if this is happening, contact us, uh, even if you're in a, a state I didn't mention. But uh, yeah, because they need to know what you need to know what his rights are. Um, it's also important, as Emily alluded, that uh they he do everything he can to um to be as bendable as he can without violating his convictions and we can work with him ahead of time so he should con anyone in that situation shouldn't just walk off the job they should contact us first so we can give them some ideas and some suggestions uh to make it easier for the employer to reasonably accommodate that employee um absent an undue burden or hardship so Okay, yeah. great. I'm going to jump yeah. right to my question then. Thank you so much for explaining that, that he should sure. go ahead and uh, contact y'all now. My question is the governor here in Washington state where I am opened up the state yesterday, as she said, 70% vaccinated, but our kids, even the private schools that I have talked to, even this morning, I talked to the principal of a private Christian school, they still mm -hmm. are masking our children starting in September for all of next year. So I wondered it just seems unconstitutional that someone else is telling us parents what to do with our children and they're blaming it on the state OSPI for the Office of Superintendents as well as the State Department of Health. And then they'll point out occasionally the local Department of Health. So what right. can we do about getting our children out of masks? Uh, and when you have your child in a private school that's requiring it, Matt? Uh, no, Matt sorry. What do you um, Huh? Sorry, I just meant it's. I'm asking for public and for private, but I actually talked to a private school 
a private Christian school principal today, okay. and they're still going to be mass. But I'm so also your question is for, for both private school. and public school. Okay, so Thank Matt, uh, what what say you on this? Um, would do parents have any right regarding private schools or public schools uh, putting out mask requirements? <laughs> A couple of thoughts on this, Brad. First, in the private school context, uh, you have uh, private schools, I think, in a few different places. If you have a, a principal in an administration who is in fear and is uh, imposing this because uh, they think that they have to, then uh, you know I think that's going to be a situation where parents may just have to, to look to a different kind of private school. And a private school that's that's not going to um, to just be in fear from right from what and, the government's and, and, and an irrational fear because the CDC has pointed out that children are not at serious risk. In fact, one study shows that kids are more likely to die from the flu if they get the the flu versus if they get the COVID nineteen. So it, it's um, it is a fear though I, I think that is driving. So that's one of the options I guess having them pull their kids out of out of that school. Um, Matt, what, what about, I mean, if, if uh, you know, if that, if that school needed information, letting them know that they don't have to, to do that, um, are we available to, to help schools like that if they want information, they have questions and they're like, gosh, you know, do I need to have, require masks? Um, will our legal staff be able to help them with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's why it's so crucial that we have the office that we do there in Washington State, so would defer to our council there for the in-depth research on that, and, and also assessing the school's particular situation. If you have a principal um, who wants to to fight this, a school uh, school board of a private school um, that wants to fight this in conjunction with parents, uh, that, that's powerful, and that's the type of situation where I could see us being much more able to get movement and come up with some creative strategies than the one I alluded to earlier with a private school. They're really, if, if your parent is trying to battle both the private school and the government, I don't think that's going to work. But when you have the two working in concert, um, then, then we could see some movement on this. And I just say one more thing to parents too. We have not begun to see uh, the last chapter written yet, even for the coming school year on uh, as far as masks are concerned, as far as CDC guidance. Uh, these things are changing so rapidly that would not surprise me at all if we get even some more favorable guidance within the next few weeks. Uh, and no, no predictions on her? that, but just, just a caution that this, this is not set in stone. For the coming what school. about for public schools? What what about for public schools? Is there any um, standing down from the mask guidelines on public? And it's going to be much more difficult to to challenge public schools, and uh, my reasoning for that is when you go all the way back to the way that the Supreme Court has talked about public versus private education, in, in all too many situations, when parents have tried to bring say constitutional challenges to the way that public schools um, are doing things or teaching their kids or from sex ed to other objectionable subjects, what the Supreme Court has tended to say is, uh, there's the door, you have the option of going to private education. And so they seem to be under this illusion that that option um, allows them to duck the harder question of whether public schools can really implement such onerous requirements. I think you're likely to see that trend continue and for courts to continue to labor under this uh, really illusion that parents' option of going homeschooling or with a more friendly private school is good enough. Okay, let's move on if we can. Good question. Uh, Robin of Silverdale, Washington. Uh, Robin of Silver, Silverdale, Washington. Silverdale, Washington. No? Okay. So you're on mute, Robin. So you got to remember to unmute yourself when I call your name or um, real important. Robin? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Kelly of Contra Costa, California. What's your question, Kelly? Kelly of Contra Costa, California. 
No? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, next one's going to be Sharon of Placer County, California. Sharon of Placer County, here. California. Yes, I'm here. Okay, great, Sharon. Uh, go ahead. What's your question? Um, my question, I think I had two. Um, my question was, um, can they, the schools mandate the vaccine if um, it hasn't been um, approved by the FDA? And yes. then next question. They, okay. And then um, my son's school is asking for to do in order to do a religious exemption, they want a letter from my church instead of a personal letter from me. Okay. Is, they can't let me say this save some time here. Uh, they can't require that the letter be from your church. Can't do that. Um, the co courts have held that. I mean, that's um, so you can, it just needs to be sincere and personal. Work with our office, contact us. We'll be happy to, to look at it, but just let it be real. Let it be personal. Cite some scriptures if you can. And, um, and that's sufficient. If that's not, if they're not going to recognize that, uh, then contact us. And we'll be more than happy to, uh, to go to bat for you. Uh, any other comments on that? Yeah, quickly, Emily, Matt, on, on that point. Yeah. I just chime in to say, yeah, there, there's, we feel very confident about that. We've actually dealt with similar kinds of questions long before um, the va the current vaccine conflicts. Uh, in the, the union context is one, Brad, where we've represented uh, objecting union members for a long, long time. Um, and that question came up quite a bit through the years in that where a union would say, oh, in order to, to get an accommodation or to opt out, you have to have a letter from your church. And so case law has been really nicely established for a long time that yeah. they can't demand that of you. That's right. Very good. Good question. Jackie in Livermore, California. After that, I'm going to call up Vicki from San Diego State University. But first, Jackie from Livermore, California. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, sure. uh, my question is, is um, I, I'm, we're having a big tr tr problem with our school board. Our school board is just absolutely being, um, they're insulting us. We keep telling them that they're violating the California Education Code 49005.8, which prohibits the use of a physical restraint or, and mask um, or any item to cover, cover a pupil's face. And um, they're not listening to us and they keep going back saying that they're, well, because they're being told by the county or they're being told by, you know, the, the health department. And we need to know, we'd like to know what recourse do we have that we can fight back and get these masks off our children's faces, but what, by utilizing the actual law and also, you know, religious exemptions. All right. Okay. Uh, Emily? Well, I, I think the trouble you're running into there, if you're talking about um, Ed Code 49005.1, is that they're talking about restraints in a, quote, behavioral context. And they're, of course, going to tell you that this is not a behavioral context per se issue. This is, you know, medical and health concerns, which is why they're deferring to the county and the CDPH. So what you'll want to do is I would lean into the religious exemption to the extent that, or accommodation, I should say, to the extent that applies to you. Of course, there are also uh, medical exemptions and accommodations that can be um, utilized. And legally, there's there's some case law that will be helpful to you, but I would also really encourage the, to echo, echo what uh, Matt was saying, which is that you know this is changing quickly, and don't let it change you know passively. This is something you want to be active about. And uh, I, I think sometimes, myself included, I just assume that this is going to get approved, that this is all going to be mandated. And I know that there are lots of groups in California and across the country working to push back at school board meetings with grassroots parents groups. And that's, you know, California Parents United, United Masks Off Our Kids, uh, the California PD, I think it's the Children's Medical Alliance group. Um, reach out to us and we can get you connected with those folks as well. So you're not just sitting back and waiting. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Uh, Vicki San, at San Diego University. Oh, you have kids at San Diego uh, State University. Vicki? Yes, so I have two daughters. One only has a semester left and she would prefer to continue being in lockdown and just do Zoom because if she walks on campus to finish her degree in engineering, she has to get vaccinated. She does not want to get vaccinated. And of course, the California schools require all those childhood vaccinations in order to get accepted into college. So both daughters have had all the childhood vaccinations are not against proven vaccines or against this experimental 
unproven one. So how do you get around that? You really can't claim, they really can't claim a, a religious exemption because the previous vaccines already had those fetal stem cells. And she actually already had COVID back in January. So don't, I don't think the state allows antibodies. The younger one unfortunately has a year left and she's a nursing student. So she's gonna have the biggest challenge because just last week she had to get her Tdap updated. So she took a vaccine, not COVID of course. So how do we work around this other than either dropping out of school and owing thousands of dollars in school right. alone or taking the vaccine and risking death or adverse yeah. reactions? Okay, uh, Emily, I'm gonna give that one to you, go ahead. Right, actually your situation is pretty similar with the nursing student to a couple people that we've already helped that were literally nursing students, uh, one in New York. And what we're doing there is there's a couple of things you can always find accommodations if they're willing to work with you on that. They may not be, especially in California where they're requiring the face, the face masks indoors. So it depends on what your objections are there. You're gonna always go back to your religious accommodation. And what we have found is when you're working one-on-one -on -one with a school, there may be still some flexibility. So just because they say that the policy, do not accept it. Because like I, I mentioned earlier in this call, we had a student who was a college student on scholarship and we were able to get an exemption for them from vaccine on the basis of her religious, her genuinely sincerely held religious beliefs and on the basis of her pre-existing natural immunity. And we, we cited the Cleveland study, the Washington study, and I put those references into the chat for you, um, but reach out to us directly and we will definitely help you. Okay, right. my uh, question Brenda? is how can you claim religious exemption when they've already had previous vaccines? It doesn't seem... <laughs> Oh, you can, uh, let me just answer that. You can have uh, religious beliefs, um, new religious beliefs. You can have old religious beliefs. Uh, you can have born again religious beliefs. So just the, I mean, I know that's one answer right, right off the bat. Uh, Emily? Well, also we have people who find, are just now finding out about the fact that, you know, chicken pox may be in, involved in stem cell aborted fetal tissue lines. You, you know, a lack of knowledge, yeah. just means you didn't have that belief 10 years ago. It just means you didn't know what was going into those vaccines. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So I think she, yeah, yeah, that, that's, I think that was well answered. And uh, if you need more help, uh, Vicki, just, or just contact us. Uh, I want to talk to uh, Brenda in New York state. Hi. Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, my situation is, is sort of similar from the other speaker. Uh, my son was accepted um, to a university that's in Pennsylvania and um, they are requesting the COVID vaccine. Um, he's been wanting to get um, the religious exemption and they keep changing the date that it's going to be available. He reached out about a, at least a month ago and they told him to reach out again in, in July 1st and July 1st is here and now they're saying mid-July. Um, and he had submitted his past immunization record. Um, we, mm -hmm. we have a religious uh, objection to these vaccines because of what we recently discovered in terms of the the connection with the fetal cell lines and as you guys were mentioning for some people that can be new information and for us it was definitely new information we okay, didn't know yeah. any of that so now he's saying they're saying that he needs the d uh, the t dap um and i was trying to i'm not a medical a professional, but I was trying to see if there were any affiliation with the the fetal cell line, so I can add that to the request for the exemption. And I'm not seeing any any connection with that particular vaccine, so he's not opposed to taking the T uh, DAP. But we're wondering okay. how it, would then they would they then try to say, well, maybe I missed some research and there is some kind of a tie, and they'll try to say that we're not being authentic with the COVID because we did the the T DAP, you know. So, yeah. so go ahead, Emily. Right. So for those um, listening, I, I, I assume when you're talking about Tdap, you're talking about the um, uh, what's it called? Um, tetanus toxinoid test. Um, and, and when you have those, I am not aware of any fetal stem cell lines being added to that. Um, if somebody has other information, of course, please reach out and let me know. But from the experts that I've reviewed, I have not seen specific objections to that. I also do have actually a resource that I'm happy to share with folks that lists out all the different historical vaccines, chicken pox, mumps, et cetera, um, and those that do and do not have relations to fetal stem cell lines and what those specific lines are. So if you want more details, reach out, please. Okay, so do you anticipate if he goes and he does the 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 Tdap, um, because like you said, I, that's what mm -hmm. I found out too, that they said that they don't use fetal cell lines. Um, it shouldn't affect his request for the, the exemption piece. 
And do you guys have any advice right. too about them keep pushing the um, the 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 time frame in which he can request this exemption because he's supposed to be reporting in August and they're now telling us they're not going to give us a, a form right. until mid July and they takes another three to four weeks before they approve it. I, I would say one thing on that, which is that you said you're in Pennsylvania and another university um, in Pennsylvania who's been beginning initial university of is asking students to fill out a seven page uh, questionnaire about their religious beliefs, which is frankly wholly inappropriate. Do not fill that out. All you have right. to do is tell them your sincerely held religious beliefs. And in your situation with the timeline, what I would say is flip it back on them and say, I have provided you what is necessary. If you need anything more, let me know. Otherwise, we will we appreciate your, you know, expediting this and we intend and plan on, you know, beginning school in the fall semester. Thank you very right. much. That's right. And if you have any pushback or problems, contact us. Uh, we have an office there in uh, New York City. Uh, we're uh, working on getting one actually in, in uh, Pennsylvania as well, uh, Lord willing, but uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, I'm going to move on now. Uh, we have uh, Pam from Kansas. Pam from Kansas, how can we help you? Pam from Kansas? Going once? Okay. Uh, how about uh, Debbie in Phoenix, Arizona? Debbie in Phoenix, Arizona, unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Debbie. Okay, so I have a similar concern. I'm between jobs right now, and I'm a registered nurse, 40 years, lots of experience. But the healthcare system here, I have low vision, and they're requiring, you know, if, you do, if you're not vaccinated, and this would be more of an office setting, like a clinical manager, not like, you know, on the unit doing direct patient care. They're requiring, even when you're sitting in your cubicle, that you have to wear a mask, which would be because I have a disability, that would be like a hardship. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure when to bring this up because I've lost several jobs and I'm highly qualified because I think I bring this up about masks or, you know, I have a religious exemption for the vaccine. I don't want to get that. I'm not interested at all. Right. Then they want me to wear a mask, which I can't wear because of my disability. So I'm like, I mean, it's really hard to get a job right now. Yeah, I know under the, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, employees uh, do have uh, a claim and, and uh, when they're asked to do something that uh, compounds or aggravates or endangers them uh, because of their, their disability, it can also be a, not only a physical dis disability, but also a mental disability. Arguably, if someone's being required to, to do something that violates their faith or religious convictions, that can create mental emotional distress, hence also a, a disability. So it's fairly broad. Um, what, uh, what do you think about this, Emily? Uh, any specific advice for her? I would document what it is if you think you're losing out on jobs out of, you know, frankly, prejudice for your religious or medical situation. I would document it. I would ask them. I would follow up because you do have a claim. Um, those are harder to prove, to be honest, um, because you don't have as much in writing usually. But we're dealing that with right now with a gentleman in Iowa who's facing similar um, distress. Matt may have um, some good advice as well. Okay, I did file a claim with the state of Arizona back in February with a position I applied for as a hospice nurse educator, and they were very difficult in the interview about the mask thing. And in fact, they, on my second interview, the first thing they said was, well, we're not comfortable with you because you can't wear a mask. That was the very first thing they said. And so I filed a discrimination case with the state of Arizona, and I'm waiting to hear how that <laughs> pans out. Okay. Um, so, but it is, okay. I just, it is happening for sure. Yeah, and it is okay. getting more difficult. Okay. Very good. Uh, Kim in Fresno, Kim in Fresno, California, unmute. And what's your question? Kim in Fresno, California going once. Okay. Uh, Susanna in Washington, Susanna in Washington. What question do you have, Susanna? Hi. Um, so my question, some of them have already been answered, but, you know, I'm just kind of forecasting that mm -hmm. the FDA is going to approve the shot. Right. And if that happens and my children are required to wear, if I, so I would want to apply for religious exemption. Um, and if they're required to wear a mask in public school, is that, is that legal? Can they do that? I mean, it just sounds illegal for them for them to be ashamed because okay. they we have chosen that that okay. was an effort question 
Okay, very good. You're in Washington State. Um, yes. Okay, we have an office up there, but uh, Emily, uh, what do you think about this? Or Matt, what do you think? Go ahead. Brett, it may be worth um, interjecting here something that's that's come to mind with a lot of these questions. You know, the mask issue, I, I think we can be clear on the one hand that the continued uh, in imposition of masks in a lot of different contexts, whether it be workplaces or schools, uh, far beyond the point at which it was ever needed. I, I can completely agree that philosophically, uh, this is a serious constitutional issue. At the same time, I think folks need to realize that from a practical standpoint, this is something that is going to be very hard fought, potentially for uh, several months, maybe even a few years to come. And we don't know where entities like our US Supreme Court, for that matter, the courts in the state of Washington are going to come down on that. We don't know what kind of freedom they're going to eventually tell us we have. We're gonna be in the middle of the fight uh, as, as long as it takes on that. But if people are thinking in terms of you know, making decisions that may uh, involve their jobs or may involve their children's education, I think they need to be fully aware that you know, we can't uh, paint a, a Pollyanna picture of what the next few months are going to be like or the next, even the next couple of years in the right. courts. We're going to fight. Uh, we believe firmly that constitutionally they're in the right and we're in the right, but we you can't assume that the courts are going to agree with us on this. So I think people right. need to no, factor that's, that's, that in when they're yeah. making these these really important decisions, and especially those yeah. that involve whether or not um, to walk away from a job. Yeah, I'm really glad you, you said that, Matt. You're right. People need to understand uh, these aren't slam dunk cases. And also, you may be in a state like California where you have a religious exemption regarding the, the vaccines uh, in a public school, uh, regarding kids in a public school or private school. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to uh, have the same uh, success with a religious exemption involving masks. Uh, the, the vaccine religious exemption in California is, is statutory. Uh, the, the one involving masks is going to be more uh, arguing on uh, constitutional rights or religious freedom uh, or proving up the facts for uh, with Americans with Disabilities Act claim, which can be very difficult. So. I'm really glad you, you uh, put that in, in perspective. That was a good job, Matt, appreciate it. Uh, Jim in Lakewood, Washington. Jim in Lakewood, Washington. We wanna get this wrapped up real quickly. So let's see if we can get um, Jim in Lakewood, Washington. No? Oh, you're on, Jim, go ahead. Jim, are you muted? You're unmuted and I can't hear you, Jim. Okay, going once, okay. Sorry, I can't hear you, Jim. Um, but uh, we're, uh, ask the question next time. We'll be uh, happy to respond to anyone who's asked, wasn't, wasn't able to get through. Wendy in Orange County. Wendy in Orange County, uh, do you have a question? Wendy in Orange County. Wendy in Orange County, okay. Brad, I actually saw Wendy's question, so I'll go ahead and answer it. It was regarding whether or not, and you've mentioned this on prior calls as well, it's about the California special rule where physicians who give five or more religious exemptions are going to be targeted for investigation. Wendy, the answer, I believe, to that one is yes, they will. That's in the SB 277 we were talking about. And um, you also asked about how is it that religious exemptions are now allowed? It's They're not allowed in California for the pre-existing vaccines that are already required, chicken pump, chicken pox, mumps, et cetera. But if they add a new vaccine requirement like COVID, then you must be entitled to a religious exemption. So um, I did read your question earlier. So there's your answer. Yeah. I hope you That's heard good. it. That's good. And, and also um, the religious, or excuse me, the medical exemption in California statutorily is different than the medical exemption under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, so just because California says, oh, you have to, it has its restrictions and you, you, you know, under California for that medical exemption, you need to get a, a doctor in California and has to be one that hasn't done more than five. Uh, that's not the same restriction you have under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, is it, Emily? No, it's not. So you wanna see, you may not be covered by one, but you may be covered by the other. 
And again, you consult your doctor. It doesn't have to be, I, I don't think it has to be a California doctor. So that's another option. Right. No, that's really good. Okay. Um, we've got, uh, we tried everyone on the list here. Uh, if there's, uh, oh, we got uh, some more. Sorry about, I didn't, but just three more real quick. Let's go through these. Uh, Orlean in Santa Rosa, uh, Orlean in Santa Rosa, California. Go ahead. I know an Orlean in Santa Rosa. Let's see if it's the same one. It is. I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Arlene. How are you doing? Only Arlene in the world, I think. <laughs> yeah, you've written, actually, you've written some really interesting books, one dealing with uh, the, the vaccine and the, the, uh, uh, the, the vaccinations for COVID-19. And um, I really appreciate uh, your, your scholarly uh, uh, writings uh, on this topic. Uh, what's your question, though? Well, thank you. First of all, I, I do have you in my book, and I so appreciate all the wonderful information you've given me and are giving today, this is just excellent. My question was, one of the things you told us to do was try to have a partnership with our church. If they're standing empty during the week, we could have homeschool parents, maybe homeschool for two days and, and work with the church for three days. I wondered how much success you're having finding churches to do this in California. Well, um, I know of, a number of them that, are, that have. I haven't been keeping a tally. Um, I don't do the, I'm not in the office where those uh, informations are coming through. I know Peter Mort is working with many, many pastors of churches. Uh, it's, it's very encouraging. Uh, it, to me, this is a, you know, we have these different times, these windows that open up and they don't stay open for long. Uh, this is one of those times in history where we have this, this big window of opportunity to reach out to kids, provide them an educational alternative, when parents are looking for alternatives more than ever before, probably in our nation's history than what's going on right now. Uh, so this is the time, and I salute all those uh, churches out there and, uh, and synagogues who um, are making an effort to really reach out uh, to the kids uh, in their congregation and outside their congregation um, to, uh, to, to benefit. So it's really encouraging. So and thank you for what you're doing, Orlean, uh, getting out the, a lot of really helpful information um, there, you have a very thick books, very well documented. And um, anyway, I, I appreciate you uh, uh, being on the program. Thank you, Brad. We appreciate you. Oh, thanks. Uh, Chu in Los Angeles, California. I think that's right. C-H-U-Y, or maybe it's, um, or maybe it's Jesus. I'm not sure. Uh, I apologize if I'm not uh, reading this correctly. Uh, in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and sure. you got it right. It's Chewy. That's the nickname. And yeah, my first name is Jesus. Okay, uh, great. My question is on behalf of a friend. Uh, she's highly concerned because I know um, OSHA had uh, reported that uh, companies would be held liable for forcing vaccinations. But I think they updated that they're no longer will be held, held liable for any like um, adverse reactions. And my friend um, has... Uh, a collapsed lung and um, she's highly concerned especially since her job said that as of august 31st if they're not vaccinated any non-vaccinated people would have to be let go okay so she she received the vaccine because of the mandate requirement of her employer and now she has a collapsed lung which she presumably i guess could could prove was from the vaccine um and that's a real important uh link no she she hasn't received the vaccine. She's hesitant because she's heard of adverse reactions and oh, her because, lung is collapsed. Right, I, I understand. Okay, that's, that's uh, I understand. Um, uh, Matt, what, what's your advice on this, on this matter? Yeah, I'm not a doctor, but it certainly sounds like a case, uh, a good argument for a medical um, exemption. So would, would definitely want to pursue that um, with her. But uh, I, I tell, as far as Cal OSHA is concerned, Brad, I sat through one of those four hour board meetings that they had when they were trying to, they kept going back and forth on what the workplace were gonna rule, gonna, gonna be. I, I tell you, it's an eye-opening experience when the people making the rules don't know what the rules are. We're completely confused about what yeah. they had adopted the last meeting they had what they were adopting in their most recent meeting. Um, 
gosh, the people making the rules don't even know what the rules are. So yeah, if you were confused yeah. out there about, about what Cal OSHA has been doing, what their latest rules are, so are they. Yeah, it's pretty pathetic. It really, it really is. It's, uh, um, you know, it, it is, it is what it is, but uh, I would uh, seek legal counsel on that. I think she could have a good case uh, at the very least under the Americans with Disabilities Act to be accommodated. Um, particularly, she has a doctor willing to stand behind her on um, opposing such a, a vaccine uh, mandate like that. Yeah, good, good call. I appreciate that, uh, Chu. Uh, uh, Jenny in California, I think that's our last question for now. So uh, Jenny in California, what's your, what's your question? Yes. Um, so my question is, my nephew is going to be going to college. Um, he has a full scholarship to play football. And the school um, said that he would not be able to travel on the team if he did not have the vaccine. Is that correct? Okay. Well, it's uh, Orlean, Matt, go ahead. Why don't you take that? It'll be great. Do we, do we know what state uh, this is in? California. Okay. I know that we have dealt with a similar issue in the Northeast. Um, and I, my recollection is that it was favorably resolved, but I would want to want to have him get in touch with us and see if the same uh, reasoning and letters that were used up there could be applied in his situation. Right. And also what, if he's already had COVID, for example, that would be another uh, defense that he already has the antibodies and uh, doesn't want to risk a, a, a greater reaction. Actually, a lot of young people have had COVID and don't even know it, a large percentage, uh, because they didn't have the symptoms. And the reason they have symptoms is because their immune system is so strong, they're not nearly as threatened by, the, by COVID. Um, but uh, just FYI, uh, we have one more question. I'm, I'm being Thank you. here. Thank you. It says, uh, hi from California. Is it discriminatory for a workplace to allow vaccinated to not wear masks and unvaccinated uh, staff to wear masks? Uh, what uh, recourse do you do unvaccinated employees have? Um, what do you say about that? Say, Emily, what do you, what's your take? I mean, on its face, of course, it's discriminatory. The question is whether or not it's illegal or unconstitutional. Um, and in the blueprint, beyond the blueprint, June 15, now aligned with the Cal OSHA requirements, as Matt was talking, they make a clear distinction between fully vaccinated and not fully vaccinated individuals. Uh, so the question is, what is the meaningful difference? They're going to argue that there's a medical health risk. And so it will be incumbent upon you to show that that what they're arguing is the meaningful difference, which is to say that you may be a carrier of COVID is not really relevant or not sufficiently relevant to merit the distinction they're making. So you would need to show that you have the antibodies or you're taking other equally, if not more um, preventative measures. You already, you know, you have the antibodies, you're getting weekly testing, you're wearing face coverings um, that in the alternative, not maybe a mask, but a face shield, your social distancing. So the question is, what are you going to do to demonstrate that the discrimination is not necessary? Right. Because, right. you know, that, that really is the nub that reach out and we can talk more. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Please feel free to reach out. We'd love to help with that. Uh, once again, I want to, I want to thank those of you out there who, uh, who do support Pacific Justice Institute in our work. It's never required. Uh, we will serve and represent everyone without charge uh, all across the country. But I do want to let you know how much we greatly appreciate those of you who do. If you want to support our work or you want to sign up to get our legal insider or you want to request for assistance or look at our free resources I've mentioned in this program, just go to pji.org, P for Pacific, J for Justice, I for Institute.org. I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, Father, we, I thank you and praise you, Lord God, that you are on the throne, that we can put our hope and our trust in you. Give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, as we deal with these these situations. Give us humble hearts, Father. Let your love shine. Um, even as we're laying claim to our rights, let us do so in a, a matter that is in, in a way that's winsome and uh, pleasing to you. Uh, we uh, thank you. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders and uh, pray for grace, Father, upon our nation um, as we uh, continue to deal with these struggles of, uh, of freedom and liberty and uh, our ability uh, to, uh, to, to lay hold and, and, and be faithful to our faith. So folks, uh, there you have it. Um, continue uh, to, uh, to strive ahead and always remember, keep the faith.